happy to discuss the neurological complications of um, SARS-CoV-2, and they can largely be divided into two. One is the acute complications, and the other is the um, uh, post-viral complications, which are largely immune-mediated. So in the acute phase, uh, you can further divide them into two, those that are hospitalized and those that are non-hospitalized patients. Uh, the ones that are hospitalized, most often they have multi-organ involvement, uh, you know, lung or kidneys and other organs can be involved. So the effects on the brain can be secondary to uh, damage to the other organ systems. Uh, in the non-hospitalized patients, most often the other organ systems are not involved. And so there could be direct effects on the brain. And the effects of the brain, one would think that either the virus is doing it directly or it could be immune mediated. And these patients can present with various kinds of manifestations. So um, and an inflammatory syndrome that's not uncommon in these patients is called um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And so you can get inflammation in the brain as well as in the spinal cord. And on MRI scan, you can see enhancing lesions. Mm -hmm. um, so some patients just have small punctate lesions. Some may have larger lesions. Uh, and it's important to recognize that because they are treatable with anti uh, inflammatory agents. Uh, there's another entity that can occur in these patients is called acute necrotizing um, hemorrhagic encephalopathy. And this is thought to be cytokine mediated. And uh, here you, the patients initially have high signal intensity lesions in the thalamus bilaterally, and then it spreads to other parts of the brain. And recognizing that is important because there are various types of anti-cytokine uh, treatments, either anakinra blocking IL-1, or tocilizumab uh, blocking um, IL-6 uh, that would be more effective in this population. Then uh, there are patients who can also develop um, long-term uh, cognitive complaints. And so these are individuals, we've been calling them long-haul patients. Oftentimes they have relatively mild disease early on, and but then they recover from it. And then a few weeks later, they start complaining of a number of symptoms. They can have uh, psychiatric manifestations with uh, psychosis, depression, uh, or uh, they can have uh, word finding difficulties, memory problems. Uh, some patients, uh, uh, it's interesting, they have insight into their uh, and their symptoms, which is a little bit unusual. Um, but um, they uh, describe a dissociation between time and object-related memories. For example, the individual may remember what they ate for breakfast, um, but they can't remember whether it was today or yesterday or a week, week ago. They also may have exercise intolerance. And so these individuals uh, will uh, complain that, um, let's say, one flight of stairs they get so exhausted, they have to lie down all the time. So I remember talking to a cardiologist in New York, and um, uh, she was doing telemedicine, and her office was on the second floor in our own house. And she says that once she climbed up the stairs, she couldn't even practice telemedicine for the rest of the day. Others complain of autonomic disturbance, so they stand up and their blood pressure falls, or they develop tachycardia, uh, they develop tingling in their hands and feet. Uh, due to vasoconstriction, or they can have bladder or bowel symptoms um, as well. Uh, some describe chest pain, but they have extensive examination of it, so they can't find anything wrong with them. So others develop some neuropathy type symptoms. So there are a variety of these kinds of clinical manifestations in these patients. And the pathophysiology of each one of them is going to be somewhat different. We looked at the brains of individuals at autopsy. And uh, here, this is a unique population. And it's a subset of non-hospitalized individuals who had died suddenly. The brains were obtained from the medical examiner's office. These individuals had died uh, in their sleep. Uh, or one guy was found dead on a subway. Another person was um, just lifting his sister, playing with her, and just fell down dead. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we looked at the brain, these, and we found a fair bit of pathology there. We were surprised these individuals were not sick enough to go and seek attention from a physician. So and now this was during the first wave, so it's possible they may have some flu-like symptom, and they thought, oh, okay, well, I got the flu, and that's why they didn't go and see anybody. Um, they had some pathology in their lungs, but it wasn't that bad either. But I think it's a very important population because had they not died from their that sudden death, which is most likely cardiac arrhythmia of some sort, they could have evolved into these long-haul type patients. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe we are seeing that kind of pathology in these individuals. We don't know for sure. But since there are millions and millions of anticipated individuals with these long haul symptoms, understanding the pathology and the pathophysiology of that is absolutely critical. And importantly, what we found was that there was these blood vessels uh, were compromised. So the small blood vessels were leaky and you could see blood products leaking out. In some places there were frank RBCs, you could see them leaking out uh, around the blood vessel. Other places you saw all these serum proteins like fibrinogen leaking out around the blood vessel. They also saw a fair bit of inflammation, largely macrophages and some T cells there. Okay. So we think it's a largely macrophage mediated disorder. There's a lot of other uh, evidence in the literature suggesting uh, an important role for macrophages. You know? And so the immune mediated phenomenon is critical in mediating neurological manifestations. We found no virus in the brain. Other people have reported viruses, but only very, very small amounts and very few individuals. So I think it's a rarity. And so trying to understand how the virus mediates these things, is it possible that viral products are formed and they are toxic and mediating it? Because you don't need the entire virus. You just need viral proteins. And we know that from studying other viruses, we've done a lot of work on HIV for many, many years and shown that uh, the TAT protein of HIV, for example, is extremely toxic and inflammatory. Um, and it's possible that these kinds of things are done by other viruses as well. 